Uh, Richard Powell is back on the line. Hey, uh, I, Duke, I have uh, President Suleiman on, on the line here. He's, he's uh, ready and willing to speak with you now. All right, sounds great. I do a great. service. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, sir. How you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, you have been the WBC president for a very long time, but I, I want to go back even farther than that and explain to us how you got involved in boxing. Where did your love for boxing come from and how you went that route and, you know, you, you became president and all of that? What, what was the path taken for that? When I was about 10, 11 years old, I went to a boxing match to, to be with my friends. But at the entrance, the ticket, uh, you know, man said, you ticket. I had no ticket. In Mexico, in the, in the province, they have what they call the orders fights. Uh, and the orders fights were between 11, 12, 13 years old kids. So, okay, I went in. They took off my shoes, my shirt. They rolled over my pants and they put me on gloves. And that's how I started boxing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, at those days, there were professional matches. So for the kids, they used to throw, to throw coins, you know, a penny, five cents a time. And after the fight, they started throwing the, the, the coins. I took off my gloves, and I started picking up the points. And the other kid, who I think that he beat me in the round, in the, in the fight, did not take off the gloves, and he could have get all of those pennies. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he beat me as a boxing but I beat him. <laughs> he got the pennies. After the fight, as he knew how to to use the gloves, to wear the gloves, I didn't. So after the fight, we had another fight. He wanted the money, I didn't want to give it to him. And you know, after that, uh, I boxed uh, amateur until the time when I was about 15, 16, and I got two fractures. I retired, and I immediately went into a boxing commission with my uncle, who was the doctor of the of the commission. And uh, at 18 years old, I was named for the first time a secretary of the commission. And all my life has started since that time. Now, you came into uh, the WBC, I, I, I thought was one of the greatest times in boxing, a lot of great history back then, mid-70s, and uh, you've been part of a lot of great fights, seen a lot of yes. great fighters, and I wanted to discuss a little bit of the history that you were able to experience. I'm going to throw a couple of fighters' names out there, and I want you to you know, tell us what you felt about them, what was it like being involved in uh, their fights, and, and the, the first guy, one guy that always fascinated me was Carlos Monzon. He was the WBA champion for many years, and then towards the end of his career, fought Rodrigo Valdez for the unified title, the WBC version of the belt, and it, those he had two great fights with uh, Valdez. If you can, tell us a little bit about Carlos Monzon and what it was like to have him as your champion. Of course, you know, uh, he and I, at the beginning, were not very, very good friends because, you know, of the difference of the, of the commission. But later on, he, uh, the WBC received the, the request for unification of the title, and uh, I was very proud because I always thought that that was also one of the greatest middleweights that ever lived. He was a uh, he was the women's love. Uh, whatever he was, whatever he went, the women after him. And he and I had many many motives of of uh, friendship. I remember once when he fought Napoli in a circus tent in Paris, 
I went with George Panassos, the great promoter of the older days. And uh, when we entered uh, into the, uh, the uh, hotel, Panassos told me that Naples didn't want to wear a uh, trouser with the name of the, uh, of the newspaper of uh, the promoter. And uh, they were giving him all the tax in exchange for that. Napoli didn't want it. Finally, they said, okay, my dear friend coming from Los Angeles to Paris will saw the name of the, uh, of the magazine. It, it used to be Liu, Louis. And uh, when he went into the ring, jumped into the ring, instead of saying Louis, it said Liu. <laughs> so he lost about $80,000 that he was going to get for wearing the trousers. Wow. Napoles beat him. <laughs> Napoles beat him. And uh, when we went to Monte Carlo for the fight with, uh, with uh, the, the Colombian Rodrigo Valdez, it was unbelievable. It was one of the greatest fights that I ever saw. Valdez really gave him a fight, but Monson was too much of a fighter, you know. And uh, it was the the prince there, and so many artists and singers as you could not imagine. And uh, one of the experiences that I enjoy most when I went to to Argentina, Carlos Monson called me on the phone. And he invited me for lunch. He never paid even to buy a newspaper. So I was surprised. <laughs> That's and, great. <laughs> and, you know, the poor kid uh, had a fight with his wife and fell from the second floor. And he got two ribs broken and his wife died. And because of the pressure from a newspaper, he was sentenced to 15 years in jail. At the 11th year, he used to go out on the weekends, and coming back on his car, he had a car crash and died. But what a fighter. Yeah, very, very sad ending for him, but we have all the great memories, and thank you for sharing some uh, great stories as well, an, another great fighter, and uh, uh, unfortunately, another sad ending, but one of my all-time favorite fighters, my top three, Salvador Sanchez. Can you talk about him yeah. for a little bit? Of course. Salvador Sanchez was undefeated in Mexico. He went to fight uh, at the uh, western side of Mexico with a great Panamanian fighter. And everybody said that he was going to destroy Sal Sanchez. And the Tolobici approved the fight as a final elimination. And the papers said that it was a, a bad decision, but Sal beat him. And immediately they signed him to fight uh, Red India Lopez, the, young, the, the, the younger brother. And Sal beat him again. The rematch, he beat him again. And became one of the greatest Mexican fighters that ever lived. You know, just before his death, he went to New York to fight Asuma Nelson, who later became a great, the greatest fighter from Africa. And the fight went to the 14th round, and Nelson was giving him a hell of a fight. Fantastic fight. But uh, Sanchez uh, finally couldn't knock him out in the 14th round. After that, he came to Mexico. And three months later, also in a car crash, he died. And uh, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people here in uh, his hometown on the farewell mass. He was Catholic that we all gave him a... Uh, for the end of his life. He was also a very nice kid. 
very decent, very respectful and respectable. And uh, he was the pride of Mexico. Yeah, and it's a very sad correlation there because you have Monzon and Sanchez, both yes. fighters. Their last fights were unbelievable. Two of their, probably their best fights of their career, definitely in the top. And they both die in uh, you know, car accidents. Very, very sad. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, great memories, and uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of stuff we love to hear from uh, you know yeah. people like you who've, who've lived, who've worked with these people. Great, great ratings yes. there. Yes, now, I remember them. Uh, many, many, many uh, occasions where we went together. We went through boxing and all the pros and cons, and and well, it's it's really a great history. And you pointed it right. They both have probably their best fight of their lives, the last one before dying. It's very, very funny to compare both, that. Both had to overcome stuff in, in, in the Monzon fight. He got knocked down early, had yeah. to get up and, and you know, fight exactly. hard at the end. Nelson, like you said, was giving it his all. And, and, and you know, we found out how great Azuma Nelson was going to be just from that fight. And, uh, yes, Absolutely. And you know, uh, talk, talking about the fight of Monson in in uh, uh, the kingdom, uh, when I went in the ring to place the bell, somebody told me, please don't go with the money. There are many people here from Latin America. They come here just to pick pockets, you know. I said, ah, oh, come on. So I put my hand in my pocket all the time because I had something good. I went into the ring and when I pulled the two hands to put the belt on and hug the champion and all that, when I went back to take my seat, there was no no wallet anymore. <laughs> wow. <laughs> many, many things in every fight that I wrote. <laughs> Wow. Now, the next fight I want to talk about, uh, Jose, yeah. maybe you, you talked about unification fights, and uh, they're great when they happen, and maybe the biggest unification fight under your uh, realm was the, in 1981, Sugar Rain Leonard and Thomas Hearns. Uh, if you can, tell us a little bit about the process of that fight becoming a unified title. That was a big topic back then, and of course, one of the greatest fights ever. Give us a yes. little bit of uh, your experience with that fight. You know, one of the greatest, uh, you know, loyalty is for me one of the greatest behaviors of human being. Sugar Ray was always very loyal to his LOBC. I was objecting to the unification title because when we do that in the United States, unfortunately, you lose all authority. The boxing organizations have no authority. We we move from the organization uh, sanctioning the fight to an observer. So being like that, we cannot do anything to protect our champions. But anyway, the fight was a must. The world wanted it, and we accepted it, you know. And it really was a great fight. It was Sugar Ray show the world that he was without a doubt the best pound per pound of his time in the world of boxing. It was a dramatic fight. I remember when uh, Tommy went out of the room with a punch and uh, uh, it, it was a great fight, really. Impressive fight. Because, you know, Tommy could punch. and But the Sugar Ray was absolutely not afraid. He was on the fight, very concentrated, excellent in boxing, and he dominated Tommy. It was yeah, a great fight without a doubt. That was a, a fascinating fight because Leonard, halfway through the fight, became the puncher, and uh, Hearns was the boxer. And Leonard, in both of their yeah. fights, I think, proved to be a harder okay. puncher against Hearns. Hearns never really <laughs> hurt Leonard as much as Leonard hurt yes, Hearns. Yes. Absolutely. That that uh, that night, Sugar Ray was really, really a superpower. And, you know, 
they have uh, they had very good fights, you know. It's, it was a series uh, with Leonard dominating the this is Leonard was to me or is to be one of the greatest fifteen boxers in the history of the sport. He's a superior he was a superior boxer. He could take a punch and he could punch. And uh one of my favorite fighters, he was a, a unified champion for many years. Marvelous Marvin Hagler, my all-time favorite, and you worked with him uh, for a long time. You witnessed all of his great fights. Talk about yes. it a little bit. Yes, well, uh, I remember when he lost the decision back in Massachusetts, I believe. I forgot right now. But it was such a fight that we had to order another opportunity for Marvin. And he had to go to London to fight the champion. At this moment, I forgot the name of the English champion, also uh, a great fighter. Alan, Alan and, Minter was the champion in London. Exactly, Minter, Minter, Alan Minter. And uh, it was a tremendous advertising against Hagler because he was a black man. And Alan Minter was the hero of Great Britain. Well, the fight took place, and Marvin just showed his greatness and got the championship and defended the title for many, many times. Uh, he is one of the very, how can I say, one of the very, very few that said, I'm going, and he never came back to fighting. And I admire him for that because most of the fighters miss the light and the money and the fame. And even and when they are retired for several years, they want to come back, and then they lose what they were. They have stains in their records. Marvin never did it. He said, I'm gone, and he was gone forever. Yeah, it's a tough thing to do, and uh, proves one of the reasons why I love him so much. And uh, yes. you mentioned the fight in London, and... That was one of the few times, maybe the only time that, that I can recall that he won. He was the undisputed champion, won the WBC and the WBA title. Great moment for him, big mountain to climb, and he was not able to be awarded the belts in the ring because a riot broke out. That was not a good. That was not a good thing at the end there, and yeah. uh, it was a, a, a sad, bittersweet for him. And uh, I mean, do you, can you ever recall something like that ever happening where a guy the, the riot was so? Oh bad yes, oh there have been the there several times. Yes, there have been several times with riots, you know, all over the world. But uh, I don't believe that he fought for the dollar B A title that time. I believe that the WBC forced the fight, and so I don't. I have to check the records, but I believe that the fight was for the WBC title. But anyway, the riot was tremendous. You know, nobody could accept because of the advertising against Hagler that he could beat the English uh, champion. It was so one day that uh, that the English uh, fans just could not be an example to the world. But it's only a small part of Finland, you know. Uh, they always make fights in soccer games and boxing and all that. It's not, it's not the people. It's only a group, a group of people. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and Marvin talked about that, and uh, they had the great... Uh, the great stuff with Howard Cosell uh, at ringside with that as well, uh, and uh, he he was certainly uh, added to the the fight experience as well. And uh, you know Marvin Sugar Ray, I mean you came at the right time. Larry Holmes, all, all of these great fighters, and then maybe one of the best ever, uh, the great Julio Cesar Chavez came on a little yeah. after that, and uh, he had an yeah. unbelievable run. Uh, you know, talk about him for a little bit. Well, you know, the people cannot picture the greatness of Julio Cesar Chavez. But, you know, uh, Joe Lewis was the highest 
World Championship fighter ever with 27 championship bouts. And uh, Chavez made 37, 10 more than Joe Lewis. He was 14 and a half years undefeated as a professional boxer and 10 years undefeated as a champion of the world. How can you compare those records to anybody else? And always fighting out of his country, out of his hometown, and mostly in the, in the nations of his challengers. He was a tremendous fighter, my God. Yeah, he, he certainly was, but uh, he he maybe held on a little bit longer than, than he should have, uh, Jose. You, you spoke about Hagler walking away, and that was it. Uh, do you think, uh, Pernell, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jose, Julio Cesar Chavez should have yes. a little earlier than he did? Yes, uh, you know, I forced him to agree to retire in Mexico City. And uh, there was a great promotion at the Plaza Mexico, and he fought uh, Randall. Uh, and uh, Randall and him had had two great fights, one and one. So the end of his career to be against Randall. He had a tough fight with Randall. Those are matters of his styles. But finally, Chavez came out to the 12th round and went after Randall from post to post and won the fight. He promised to Mexico, to myself, that that was his last fight of his life. No. He returned. They offered him with uh, people that couldn't carry his, uh, his bag to the gym, and he got beat. Only for a few dollars. And this, those are the sad happenings of so many fighters in the world, you know, in history. They come back and they don't have what they had. They only had the love of the people. And they come back and they get hurt. That's the everlasting problem. Yeah, and we see it all too often. And uh, But, uh, you know, Chavez is still didn't lose any greatness, even though he maybe fought a little bit longer than he should. And around yes. the time Chavez was getting recognition, uh, a fellow by the name of Mike Tyson was coming on the scene. And Mike Tyson was the first, uh, the WBC was the first heavyweight championship that he won when he beat Trevor Burbick in 1986. He took not only the boxing world, but the sports world by storm. Talk about Mike Tyson a little bit. Well, you know, Jim Jacobs, was his manager with Cos D'Amato being his trainer. And he came to Mexico City once and brought with him a video to show me that he had a fighter that had won the first 18 fights by the South in the first round. And he told me he's going to be the best champion in history, blah, blah, blah. And as all the managers tell me the same thing, you know, I just accepted it. But my God, what a champion he became. Unbelievable. Jim Jacobs and Dan King, they had a contract together to have him fight against the Trevor Verbeck for the title of the Dollar BC. The youngest in the history of the heavyweight, I believe that he was about 18 years old or 20. I don't recall right now. But he probably was 20 years old. And he defeated Randall dramatically. And uh, all the evening and the following day, he went through the lobby of the hotel with his belt. He was so proud to be the champion of the world. But I never at the time thought that he was to be, going to become such a great, devastating fighter. But, you know, Mike Tyson was the hero of the world for a decade. And he was a fantastic style, a devastating puncher, and a, and, and a kid by heart that was not understood by the people. He, after so many 
discrimination actions and words, he became very sour against the people because of the long, long time that he was hurt by the people that really like him. And uh, Mike Tyson, to me, is a very nice man. He likes children. He came to Mexico, and one day he was being waited for a purse offer and a press conference, and he didn't show up for an hour. When he showed up, he came with about 25 kids with new clothes and new shoes and eating candy. <laughs> he, he made the press wait for an hour because he was buying for the very poor kids clothes and shoes. Wow, that's great. And Tyson was also, especially at the time when he was becoming the young champion, very much a boxing historian. He was a student of the game. He appreciated the history of it, uh, uh, Jose. I'm not sure all fighters were like that. No, 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 I'm not. I, you know, I believe that uh, Tyson changed when he got, uh, when he got married. I remember that we went to to uh, the first fight in Japan, and he was looking for his wife all the time. <laughs> but then in Japan, we had one of the greatest problems that the WBC has ever had, when he lost the the, the championship after he had knocked down Thomas for 14 and a half seconds. The referee had a very slow count, and uh, Buster Douglas got up and uh, and knocked out Tyson. It was a big, big, big problem. One of the biggest in the 50 year history of Dolo BC. Yeah, I remember that was a, a, a big deal, but. Uh... You know, the Douglas went on to lose to Holyfield, and uh, you know the rest is uh, history and a great history of boxing that you're taking us through here, Jose. We really appreciate it. But I want, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some modern day issues, if you will. Sure. And sure. one of the one of the biggest topics on, on your spectrum right now is the the Derek Chisora David Hay fight, which is I think still taking place in, in London. Uh, the WBC is taking a stance uh, in regards to this fight. Can you share it for Zoots Boxing Talk about the yeah. fight? Sure. Well, the fight was in Germany, in Munich, and he fought the champion Vitaly Klitschko. And everybody was surprised that during the weigh-in period, Chisora smacked the champion on the chin. And uh, Vitali, instead of going back, you know, he was surprised that he didn't know what to do, but he was a gentleman. And uh, they took Kisora away, and we were talking about what to do and all that. It was an embarrassment for the sport of action. But, well, the following day came, and they went to check his bandages. He had started to bandage his left hand already, when the representative of Vitaly Klitschko said, I didn't see the beginning of the bandaging. So he's got to take it off, and, uh, and if not, we will not fight. The, the, she, no, she sort of said, if you do not, not I will not fight. It is, uh, and then they pushed him, you know, and they said, okay, I will not fight, and took off the bandages just before the fight. Finally, they convinced him to go in the ring, and he started saying, you know, swears and all that in the ring. After the fight, or when all the people came into the ring, Vitaly's brother Vladimir came, and he had a mouthful of water. And he went to him and, and uh, how do you say that, threw the water to his face. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after that... There was a uh, press conference, and in the press conference, the retired boxer, Hay, started asking him questions, tough questions. He got mad, 
So he left the the podium and went into the public to fight with Hay. And Hay got a tripod and the store, oh, no, no, it was terrible. So the WGC and the Boxing Commission of Germany acted immediately. And uh, and we had a, a uh, fine and uh, suspension until the time that we had a hearing. When he go back to England, the British body uh, box of control just withdrew his license because they said that England could not live with such an embarrassment for boxing. After that, now he is suing, not only suing the British board, but he wants to fight Hay, who is retired, has no license, and they got a license from Luxembourg, the Boxing Commission of Luxembourg, that accepted to invade the territory of the British Boxing Board of Control and come to England and sanction a fight in a different country. So the, the whole world in boxing commissions are going against it. For the promoter, Frank Warren, he doesn't care. He's going to promote that fight in England with a national different boxing commission coming to sanction the fight. And uh, you guys are, are firmly against it, but it does look like the fight is still going to happen. Well, we cannot uh, stop it legally. But as far as we are concerned, Luxembourg has been expelled from the WBC for life. All right. Well, th that That's uh, very important information, and uh, we thank you for relating that to the fans. And another, another hot topic, Jose, is uh, we talked about Julio Cesar Chavez, his son Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., uh, Everybody wants to see him and Sergio Martinez uh, collide. There has been some, uh, I think, misinformation about uh, the stance of that fight happening. Tell it for us straight. When is that fight going to happen, and what has to happen for it to happen? The WBC's convention in Las Vegas ruled to have Chavez and Martinez fight for the title. They had two commitments, and we allowed them to fight the fight, the dates that they had with the winners to fight each other. The WBC has not set aside at all for that commitment. Chavez said, why am I going to wait from January until September for the fight with Martinez? I want to have another fight. So we said, if the Martinez group accepts you to have the fight, we have no problem. After 28 rounds of punching <laughs> among the parties, they finally agreed to allow Chavez to have this defense with the condition that the winner would fight Martinez. And that's what's happening. Chavez is fighting for June 16 against Andy Lee a British fighter who is very, very tough. He's a lefty. And uh, <clears throat> they continue throwing punches to each other, using the Twitter, the Facebook, and all that, that are a pain for boxing today. Because many people use Twitter and Facebook to say very bad words, you know, swears and and, and attacks and accusations, and, and they, they uh, hide in anonymity, and it's not easy. But the WBC does not change its line. The winner of June 16 must fight Martinez by September. And, and that's a big, uh, a big deal, uh, great information. And Chavez Jr. has been a guy that has been heavily... Uh, scrutinized, I think, for the most part, without justification. And, you know, how could you knock him? And he has, like you said, has to fight a tough 
Nia and Andy Lee, and then he has to fight Martinez if he gets past that. There's not much to criticize there, Jose. That, that's a tough deal for any champion. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe that he will show that there's... Look, in Mexico, we have two big groups. 50% of this country is in favor of Canelo Alvarez, the present super welterweight champion of the world of the Dolo BC. And the other group is in favor of Chavez, who is the WBC middleweight champion of the world. So the Chavez fans always attack Canelo, and the Canelo fans always attack Chavez. And that's what's bothering Chavez. It's very unfair because he won the title against Sebastian Zvik, who is one of the very best middleweights and who Martinez didn't want to fight. And then Chavez has, has been showing that he's a good fighter. I think that the fans should give an opportunity to show himself, to prove himself. And he is doing it very well. Yeah, he has a tough road ahead, and I think he's improving with every fight. And it's not just about his last name. He wouldn't be here if it wasn't. He He's come a long way in... Uh, Canelo is also very exciting. A lot of exciting happenings uh, with these champions, and we just can't wait to see them grow yeah. even more. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the WBC is a, a proud organization, and, but one of the things that has uh, really given boxing a, a, a bad name overall is the scoring. The judges, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Richard Powell now so you guys can discuss what the WBC is doing in terms of trying to improve the judges, trying to improve the sure. scoring. Take it away, Richard. Yeah, but See, just, just, just let, let, me, let me make a comment about what you were talking about that, you know, uh, about Chavez. Uh, I believe that uh, the problem with Chavez now, I'm very worried. Chavez was training with uh, the, uh, with Pacquiao's Fred Roach. Fred Roach is totally devoted to Pacquiao now because Pacquiao is fighting also in June. And he didn't have time for Chavez. So Chavez came to train on his own in Las Vegas. And I'm very worried about this because it might, we don't know what might happen. But that's boxing. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a rough deal. And thank you for bringing that to our attention. I was not aware of that. So will yes. Freddie Roach not be in the corner? Will he still work the corner the night of the no. fight? He will he not. He might work the corner, yes. He I might. think that he will. I don't know. But he is not with Chavez training now. He's training on his own in Las Vegas. Yeah, Roach doesn't... is in Los Angeles. Doesn't sound like the uh, activities of somebody who is spoiled and has everything handed to him as what a lot of people like to perceive about Chavez. That, that's, that's a tough that's deal. Ex that's exactly the point. All right. And, and, and Richard, take it away. Okay. Uh, Don Jose, uh, I'm so honored to be on the same program with you. I um, was Thank able you. to uh, yeah. attend the WBC convention here in Las Vegas uh, last December. Um, I came to the convention uh, thinking that this was just going to be a, a, a way for legends to get together and talk about the old <laughs> days or whatever. And I came away with just a, a completely a different viewpoint of uh, and respect for you and the WBC. The, you opened the convention with a speech that just had everybody's jaw dropping to the floor. I mean, we were... Uh, I was sitting there with the biggest names in the sport, George Foreman, Marvin Hagler, Sugar yeah. Ray Leonard, Floyd Mayweather Sr. It just goes, every, uh, Tony uh, DeMarco, every uh, boxing legend that you could pretty well imagine was there. And yeah. I expected you as a president of this organization to be uh, very comfortable, uh, very uh, uh, secluded from the crowd, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, misinterpretations about uh, I had that I thought what you were going to be. And sure. the WBC is the most 
proactive, action-oriented organization that I know. Um, That's good. I wanted to – you brought up open scoring, and I want you to get to that in a minute. But, you know, we just had Keith Kaiser – uh, from the Nevada Athletic Commission on the show right before you, and he addressed open scoring. But yes. uh, the reality of the problem with uh, why we even need open scoring is because of perceived uh, inadequacies with the judging. And uh, you guys at the WBC put on a, a, a clinic, and it was it was a real event. I mean, there were judges from all over the world there. Some of them were very young the WBC was very committed to curing the problems with the sport today. And you had some of the biggest names in the sport in there as instructors. There was a question and answer session. There was videos that were shown of recent fights. The same thing happened for referees. Uh, they showed uh, Joe Cortez and his video with uh, um, his officiating over the Mayweather-Ortiz fight. It was a real thing. And I've been to some other events with some other sanctioning bodies and those things are basically for show and this thing here was real um could okay. you talk a little bit about number and the the thing that really amazed me the most too is that the wbc as the sanctioning body is not really responsible for judges it's not really responsible for referees even though you get blamed for these things a lot could you talk about what what your role is and how you see the judging being fixed and what the WBC is doing about it? Sure. First of all, let me tell you that the United States is the only country where the WBC cannot participate with the appointment of judges. We have very nice friends and uh, reciprocity, and they accept the WBC to appoint two ring officials and they appoint two. Uh, uh, and it has been working, you know, not too good. Because the WBC has two times a year clinics for the world uh, ring officials. We examine every fight and we send the videos to the working ring officials so they see what we recommend. We have the highest trust and confidence on the WBC ring officials. But whether a unification or that also, we go to any boxing uh, state, other ring officials are brought that, that have not passed through the clinics that we have. So the uniformity in the scoring is that seen. Uh, the WBC then started to see so many bad, at least uh, controversial decisions. Let me put it that way. And then I, it came to our mind one thing. In baseball, you have runs. No problem. Soccer, you have goals. Football, you have touchdowns. Every sport, there is a scoring. You score, you win by the score, regardless of the sport. There are some like the, the diving, they don't score. But the judges score after every dive of every man or lady jump into the swimming pool. They know exactly how the score is at the moment of they make the jump. If you go to the uh, even the ballet or the Olympic, uh, I don't know what they call it, the, the 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 lady or the athlete comes, does the show, the dancing, and the ballet, and the ice skating. The judges immediately score their performance. The only the only one sport in the world that doesn't have that is boxing. Mystery. Uh, gambling. Uh, Inclination in favor of boxers. And we don't know. Thousands of people are seeing the fight and waiting until the last moment when the last round ends to see who won. So you have bad decisions, controversies, people always talking bad about the sport of boxing. So we decided four years ago 
to bring in the the score announcement every four. I'm I'm sorry. After the air fourth in the eighth round, in in the, we were not going to tell the people the names of the judges who were scoring. So we say Judge A, Judge B, Judge C, and it has been a great step into the sport of boxing for the good of the sport, because now not only the people, not only the commissioners. But now the boxers know how the score is going. We have consulted with every boxer that you can think of. Leonard Lewis, Ray Leonard, Mike Tyson, Roberto Duran, everybody says, I would have loved how I was going in my fights. Many of them thought that they were openly winning, and they realized that they weren't. Recently, right. recently, Julio Cesar Chavez fought Rubio at the end of the eighth round. The fight was very close. So they knew what they had to do. And we had the toughest four rounds that you can think of. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Chavez went to win. Mm -hmm. He knew that the score was close, and he went to win. Excellent. We also... You know, and, now, now in, I'm sorry to interrupt you. In Texas, they accept now our uh, system, but they will not allow the announcement to the public. That's fine, as long as the boxers in the quarters and all the commission knows how the fight is being scored. Yes. The judges also see the fight in a different manner. They feel more committed to be absolutely concentrated and fair. And we are very proud because it's working very well. And I have to let you know that it is catching on because um, I was uh, asked by Joel Diaz, who is Timothy Bradley's uh, trainer, uh, I presented a letter to Keith Kaiser here in Nevada. To uh, They requested open scoring in their fight with Manny Pacquiao. So uh, I went round and round with them, and we talked about it over and over again before they decided to do that. Um, we are running short on time here, so I want to move on to the next topic, if I may. Yes. Yes. Um, another thing that you spoke about in your speech last December was this retirement fund that the WBC has set up for boxers that – were maybe champions in the past or uh, great fighters and now for one reason or another have fallen on hard times. And I know that in September you teamed up with uh, Hublot, the, uh, the watch manufacturer, and uh, could you talk about the program that the WBC and you have started for these guys? Of course. We have appointed five people out of boxing, but highly prestigious and with money, to be an in independent body to manage the funds. The WBC does not want to touch that. It's going to be that committee. We are going to have this Hublot uh, building in Las Vegas sometime in September so that the people would buy a, a equal, equal pair of watch from the heroes like Marvin Hagler, George Foreman, everyone is going to receive a watch. But a, how do you say that, a second, uh, a similar watch is going to be for Billings. And we expect to we'll get at least $1 million. Next step is that in September also, we are starting the WBC Professional World Boxing Cup. The, the champions of all the 10 confederations, plus the silver champions and the international champions will fight in this cup. And all the money that we get from that is going to go to that, to that the fund. You know, for me, that has been 67 years in boxing, who has seen so many fighters in greatness in the limelight and living a luxurious life, and then after time goes by and you see him in, in, in absolute poverty. How can you expect that to be? We cannot allow it. Boxing cannot forget his boxer. We uh, enjoy boxing. 
We don't go in the ring to fight each other. We have the others fight. When the end of their lives comes, they are poor. So it's our commitment to see with love and care the third world age, as we call them in Mexico, fighters, to receive some pension so that they can live with dignity. And and that's uh, great stuff there, uh, uh, Jose. Uh, very, very, very inspiring. And I have – I'm going to open the phone lines. We're a very special uh, – Person here wants to give you a, a hello. Yes. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hello. hello. Dr. Suleiman. Yes. Who's this speaking? This is, this is Eddie Mustafa Muhammad. I hello, my champion. champion. <laughs> but I, I'm always I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what you're doing with your organization. And I have Thank always you. respected you. Because thank you, you bring boxing to the forefront. Thank you, know, you. Thank you. Thank you. You look out for the boxers that are, have fallen on hard times, and I respect yes. that. And I respect thank you that so much. I want, I want you, you to know that you have been a pride of the WBC. You were a great you. power, and I respect you very much. Thank you. If there's anything I can do. Rich Powell got my number. Just let me know, and I'll be there. No problem. Thank you, and I will look for you because I need all the great heroes of boxing to join the program. Thank you. Anytime, anywhere, any place. <laughs> Thank you very much, my dear friend. All right. Okay, Thank you. Eddie Thank Mustafa you. Muhammad, another one of the best to ever do it in the light heavyweight Absolutely. division. One of my favorites, uh, and – in the era when you were overseeing uh, the great WBC yes. and all, all the great fights, and Eddie's yes. now a great trainer, and uh, yes. you know, he doesn't come on and, and give his endorsement to just anybody. So I you mean, know, uh, but he's just, he's a great fighter, and he's a great man, person. He's very, very, very nice man. I respect him very much. Oh, this was a great. Great. I mean, the time just flew by here, and uh, we're winding down, and I thank you, uh, sir, for all your great information, and uh, keep up all, all the great stuff that you're doing, and we, we, you seem to have a lot of great fights on the horizon, and that's going to be exciting for yes. us. Uh, Richard, any any other questions? No, well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me thank you for bringing Floyd Mayweather, the only other is folk, and now Mustafa. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, get one final thought from Don Jose on if yes. he knows uh, Diego Magdaleno. He's our local uh, hero here in Las Vegas. He's the uh, NABF champion for the WBC. Yes. And he was actually named uh, the day before yesterday the NABF Fighter of the Year. Uh, Absolutely. What do you think of Diego, and what do you see, think his prospects are for the future? Well, let me tell you first that he is going to be – one of the boxers to fight in the WBC World Cup. And the payment for those boxers is going to be very good. We are having sponsors by, by, uh, sponsors by important companies, and it's going to be televised all over the world. And the pay for the champions participating is going to be very interesting. And he is going to represent the NABF in this World Championship. The World Cup. Well, great. Thank you so much. All right. Sounds very good. Sounds very exciting. WBC President Jose Suleiman, love talking the sport with you. Love to do it again. I'll give you the final words. Well, uh, thank you so much for letting me speak to the people. Many people do not know what the WBC is. And we are a non-for-profit organization dedicated to the service of boxing. We don't do much advertising, but we work. And I really hope that there will be many people like you to give us this opportunity. We do not receive every day. So I deeply appreciate the opportunity to let me talk to you people. All right. It's been a great pleasure, and we'd love to do it again. Thank you. Anytime. All right. My pleasure. 
Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.